Now let us discuss about moving charges and magnetism. In this module we are going to study about introduction about moving charges and magnetism and important points in Bayard's Avert law, Ampere's circuital law, torque and magnetic dipole followed by practice questions. Let us first understand the sign convention in moving charges and magnetism. This sign depicts current or a field, the field could be either electric or magnetic, that emerges out of the plane of the paper. And this sign depicts current or a field that is going into the plane of the paper. Some important points about moving charges and magnetism. Static charges produce electricity whereas moving charges create magnetic field. Magnetic field is represented by the letter B and force on a charge due to magnetic field is equal to Q into V into B. That is Q is the charge and V is the velocity and B is the magnetic field. Lorentz force states that the total force on a charge is sum of the force due to electric field and the force due to magnetic field. The magnetic field force can also be given as QVB sin theta, where theta is the angle between the velocity vector and the magnetic field. Unit of magnetic field is Tesla. Magnetic force on a current carrying conductor is given by B into I into L, where B stands for magnetic field and I stands for current and L stands for length of the conductor. Let us understand motion in a magnetic field. The charged particle will describe a circular motion if velocity vector and field vector are perpendicular to each other. The radius of circle thus described will be equal to mv by qb. The velocity vector is not perpendicular to the field vector. The charged particle describes a helical motion. In such case, the radius form is called the radius of the helix. Now let us understand velocity selector. If the electric force is equal to magnetic force, then the velocity is equal to e by b. The crossed E and B field serves as velocity selector. Only the particles with speed E by B passes through the crossed E and B field undeflected. Now let us understand the cyclotron frequency formula. Cyclotron frequency can be given by QB by 2 pi m. Magnetic field due to a current element can be calculated using Biot Servet law. As per Biot Servet law, magnitude of magnetic field due to a current element is given by dB equal to mu naught by 4 pi I dl sin theta by R square. Where mu naught by 4 pi is 10 power minus 7 Tesla meter per ampere and mu naught is the permeability of free space. Let us understand the similarities and difference between Biot Servet law and Coulomb's law. Both these laws are related to long range. Both depend inversely on the square of distance from the source to the point of interest. The principle of superposition applies to both fields. The differences are electrostatic field is produced by a scalar whereas magnetic field is produced by a vector source. Electrostatic field is along the displacement vector and magnetic field is perpendicular to the plane containing displacement vector. There is angle dependence in Biot Servet law which is not present in the electrostatic case. A magnetic field on the axis of a circular current loop is given by B equal to mu naught I R square by 2 X square plus R square power 3 by 2. That is, this is the magnetic field at a point P 
However, if x equal to 0, that is, if we consider a point at the center of the loop, then the magnetic field will be equal to mu naught i by 2r, where r is the radius of the loop. And direction of the magnetic field is given by right hand thumb rule. Now, let us understand Ampere's circuital law. Ampere's circuital law states that the circular integral of b dot dl is equal to mu naught times the total current. For a current loop of length l, bl equal to mu naught ie. ie is nothing but the current enclosed by the loop. Also, magnetic field in a solenoid and toroid are the same and it is equal to mu naught ni where n is the number of turns in the solenoid or a toroid. Now let us understand torque on a rectangular current loop in a uniform magnetic field. Magnetic moment in a current loop is given by m equal to ia where a is the area vector and torque is given by cross product of magnetic moment and magnetic field thus m cross b which is equal to m b sin theta. The loop has n turns. The expression of torque still holds with m equal to n into i into a. Let us understand magnetic dipole. Magnetic field due to current in a circular loop is very similar in behavior to the electric field of an electric dipole. In a revolving electron, mu L by L is equal to E by 2 Me, this is also called as gyromagnetic ratio, where mu L is the magnetic moment associated with the circulating current and L is the angular momentum. Mu L minimum will be equal to 9.27 into 10 power minus 24 ampere meter square. This is one Bohr magneton. Now let us get on with practice questions. Question number one, a square coil of side 10 centimeter consists of 20 turns and carries a current of 12 amperes. The coil is suspended vertically and the normal to the plane of the coil makes an angle of 30 degree with the direction of uniform horizontal magnetic field of magnitude 0 0.80 Tesla. What is the magnitude of torque experienced by the coil? We know torque is equal to n i a b sin theta, where n is the number of turn, i is the current, a is the area, b the magnetic field and sin theta. On substituting relevant values, we get torque equal to 0 0.96 Newton meter. Question number 2. Under what circumstances Newton's third law is valid in an electrical circuit? The answer is, in an electrical circuit, when current vary with time, Newton's third law is valid only if momentum carried by the electromagnetic field is taken into account. Question number 3. In a chamber, a uniform magnetic field of 6.5 g, where 1 g is equal to 10 power minus 4 tesla is maintained. An electron is shot into the field with a speed of 4.8 into 10 power 6 meter per second, normal to the field. Explain why the path of the electron is a circle. Determine the radius of the circular orbit. The magnetic force F is equal to QVB act normal to the direction of motion. Thus this force provides the necessary centripetal force to follow the circular path. Now let us calculate the radius of the circular path. We know F equal to QVB. Also we know F equal to MV square by R. Thus QVB equal to MV square by R and thus R equal to MV by QB. Substituting relevant values we get the radius equal to 42 millimeter. Question number 4. A toroid has a non-ferromagnetic core 
of inner radius 25 cm and outer radius 26 cm around which 3500 turns of a wire are wound. The current in the wire is 11 ampere. What is the magnetic field outside the toroid, inside the toroid and in the empty space around the toroid? For question A, the magnetic field outside the toroid is 0. However, inside the toroid, the magnetic field is given by B equal to mu naught n i or B equal to mu naught capital N i by 2 pi r. And r is equal to inner radius plus outer radius by 2. Thus, r equal to 25.5 centimeter. On substituting relevant values, we get the magnetic field value as 3 into 10 power minus 2 Tesla. For question C, in the empty space around the toroid, magnetic field is 0. Question number 5, an electron emitted by a heated cathode and accelerated through a potential difference of 2 kV enters a region with uniform magnetic field of 0.15 Tesla. Determine the trajectory of the electron if the field is transverse to the initial velocity or it makes an angle of 30 degree with the initial velocity. To find out the trajectory, let us first calculate the velocity of the electron. The energy gained by the electron is equal to 2000 electron volt, which on calculation we can get 1000 into 1 1.6 into 10 power minus 19. Also we know kinetic energy of the electron equal to half mb square. Equating half mb square equal to energy gained by the electron, we get velocity equal to 2.66 into 10 power 7 meter per second. Now we know the velocity of the electron equal to 2.66 into 10 power 7 meter per second. For question A, the field is transverse to the initial velocity. The magnetic field is normal to the velocity of the electron and hence the electron follows a circular path. Radius of this circular path can be given by r equal to mv by bq thus r equal to 1 mm. Now for question B, if the magnetic field makes an angle of 30 degree with the initial velocity, what happens to the trajectory? The answer is, if the velocity makes an angle with the magnetic field, then the trajectory defined by the electron will be a helix. Question number 6. An electron moves around the nucleus in a hydrogen atom of radius 0.51 angstrom with a velocity of 2 into 10 power 5 meter per second. Calculate the following. The equivalent current due to orbital motion of electrons. The magnetic field produced at the center of the nucleus. The magnetic moment associated with the electron. For the first question, the equivalent current due to orbital motion of electrons. We know I equal to charge per unit time. Thus velocity into charge by circumference of the atom, we get 1 into 10 power minus 4 ampere. This we are getting by working with the units. So I equal to velocity into charge by circumference. Thus we get meter per second into coulomb by meter. So once the meter gets cancelled out, we get coulomb per second. For question B, the magnetic field produced at the center of the nucleus, we have the formula B equal to mu naught I by 2R and substituting relevant values we get B equal to 1.23 Tesla. For question C, the magnetic moment associated with the electron, magnetic moment M is equal to I into A that is I into pi R square. And substituting relevant values, we get m equal to 8.2 into 10 power minus 25 ampere meter square. Question number 7. Explain giving reasons. The basic difference in converting a galvanometer into a voltmeter and an ammeter. The answer is, a galvanometer can be converted into a meter by connecting a low shunt resistance in parallel with it so that most of the current bypasses through the shunt resistance 
enabling the galvanometer to measure much larger currents. A galvanometer can be converted into a voltmeter by connecting high resistance in series with it, so that most of the voltage applied drops across it, enabling the galvanometer to measure much larger voltage.